Okay, so Gordon, we're going to mute you. All right. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining Peer's October meeting. Uh, this meeting, the meeting tonight, uh, first of all, my name is Catherine Zoka, for those of you who I haven't not yet met. Uh, the meeting tonight is going to focus on the New York voting reform bills, and we ha will have a local candidate forum. Uh, Peer recognizes that our members are fortunate to live on the ancestral territories of the Manhasset, Montaukett, and Shinnecock nations. Peer is a multi-issue grassroots organization committed to advocating for issues that impact Long Islanders, including healthcare, housing, climate, and social justice. And we do so through electoral politics and issue-oriented engagements. We welcome you to join Peer, and I will drop in the chat later on information on how you might be able to do that. So what to expect tonight? Um, as I've said, the event is being recorded. And again, I'll ask those who are not already muted to please mute yourself. Um, and when we have an opportunity to ask questions, I'm gonna have you at, drop them in the chat and Julie Sheehan from Peer is going to, will either call on you or she will read the questions. But first we're gonna hear from Karen Wharton who is uh, coming to us this evening from Citizen Action New York. Then we will have the candidates forum. Uh, the candidates will briefly introduce themselves, identifying key challenges in their campaigns, after which we will have a, a moderated discussion. So let me just mention to you which candidates we have. Uh, from Southampton, we have Supervisor Candidate Maria Moore and Town Board Candidate Michael Iacelli. From East Hampton, we have Town Board Candidate Thomas Flight. And hopefully soon to be joining us, we will have the Suffolk County Legislative Candidate Ann Welker with us. Um, after the moderated discussion, there will be an opportunity for people, for participants to ask questions and answers. And we will end with call to action. So at this point, again, I thank everybody for joining us this evening. I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry Maslanka from Pierre, who will introduce Karen Wharton. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Um, yes, so we do have Karen Wharton with us. Um, she's a Democracy Coalition Coordinator for Citizen Action of New York and Public Policy and Education Fund. In this capacity, she supports the implementation of the New York State Public Campaign Finance Program aimed at reforming campaign finance in the state. She is dedicated to developing a BIPOC-centered democracy, advocating for the protection and expansion of voting rights and ensuring that democracy is truly representative of all voices. So Karen will um, introduce us and uh, to the 10 bills that were recently signed by Governor Hochul, um, our reform um, voting bills. And she will highlight a few of those. And later on, we will put a link in the chat where you can go for further detail and explanation of these things, uh, these bills. So Karen, why don't you go ahead and take it away for us? <laughs> sure. Well, thank you so much, Jerry, Catherine and uh, peers, members, candidates, and guests. Uh, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Uh, I have a, brief, a fairly brief presentation uh, of, um, I'm gonna go over some of, well, the highlights of uh, the slew of uh, election reform bills that were recently signed into law by uh, Governor Hochul. So let me begin by sharing my screen. Here we go. Uh, so yes, yeah, so, so I'm gonna just review, uh, I think maybe like four or six of them. And uh, I will um, drop something in the chat later uh, where you can get some more information if you so choose. So let's get right into it. Uh, well, the first one, and this is a biggie, uh, that was signed into law, it's, it's, it is called the New York Early Male Voter Act, or uh, the Early Vote by Mail. And it creates a process which uh, registered voters in New York can request uh, a ballot, an early vote by mail ballot, uh, without needing to provide a reason for doing so. Uh, so um, the absentee ballot, as we know it, 
you need to provide uh, one of or choose one of five reasons, uh, penalty, perjury, so you can't lie. And basically, you can only access it if you know in advance that you're going to be out of town or ill or you're uh, disabled. But with this new system, voters will be able to request the ballot up to 10 days before election if they would like to vote by mail. And then the election board will then provide them with mail ballots with postage paid return envelopes, which is good. Uh, and uh, New Yorkers can then... Um, you know, fill out the ballots uh, in the privacy of their home and return it. So this will benefit, uh, you know, for people who are disabled, for instance. Uh, recently, the Brennan Center uh, did a study along with the New York Disability Rights Group. And uh, they researched, they studied the 2022 elections and found that 94% of in-person early voting sites were not fully accessible for people with disabilities. And a lot of that was based on um, the ballot marking devices uh, were either not working or uh, poll workers lacked critical uh, in, uh, information about the ballot uh, marking devices. So people who were disabled could not access them. So with this new uh, legislation will bypass all of that. If you want to, if you're disabled and you want to, you can ask for a ballot uh, and you can fill it out at home. If you're not disabled, if you just don't want to go to the poll site or for whatever reason. Uh, so we feel this legislation will significantly expand ballot access in New York and it'll provide millions with uh, an easy, safe and secure means of voting early. Uh, a favorite of mine is the golden day uh, for early voting. And what that is, is on the first day of the early voting period, uh, anyone who is eligible to vote, so a U.S. citizen, 18 years or older, and had been living in New York, the state of New York, 30 days or more, can go to an early voting poll site on the very first day of early voting register to vote and vote at the same time and have their uh, votes uh, be counted. Uh, and so this is essentially uh, same day voting on one day, a golden day. Uh, the goal is to have same day registration throughout the entire uh, voting cycle from early voting all the way to the actual day uh, of election, but baby steps. Um, the, a second one is the polling place uh, uh, location deadline. Uh, so there's now a deadline set uh, for changing the location of a poll site, polling place during early polling periods. Uh, this may not be uh, applicable to where you where you live, but in some areas, uh, like polling sites, early voting polling sites will just arbitrarily, well, may not be arbitrarily, will just suddenly change. So voters show up to what they think would be the, their site only to find that it was changed. So now with this law, this legislation uh, that has been signed, uh, the Board of Elections will cannot change a polling site any, uh, will, any sooner than uh, 48 hours before uh, early voting. So, you know, that says, what did I say? Any sooner? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Uh, they cannot change it two days, up to two days before early voting begins. That's the deadline. Unless uh, there is a declared emergency or disaster. So now, uh, there have been some changes, some reforms around electoral education. And one of them is voter registration information for re release inmates. And it requires local jails to provide voter registration information to again, eligible New Yorkers of voting age uh, who are being released from a correctional facility. So before the release from a local correctional facility of any person convicted of a felony, the chief administrative officer has to notify uh, the person both in writing and verbally that their voting rights will be restored up 
upon release. And if the person needs uh, assistance filling out the form, uh, that has to be given as well. And then the person can either uh, submit the voter registration form upon being released or ask for assistance from the uh from the corrections, uh, from the facility, the facility. Uh, and they'll be able to submit it for them. Uh, the second one along the same educational reforms, uh, uh, ed ed electoral educational reform, is a student uh, voter registration policies. And this require, requires uh, local board of elections, board of educations, I'm sorry, board of educations, boards of cooperative educational services, charter schools, and non-public schools to adopt policies that promote uh, student uh, voter registration and pre-registration. So if you are 16 or 17 year old, and uh, right now you can pre-register, and when you turn 18, you'll automatically receive uh, you know, your voter ID, um, the little card that they, the Board of election sends you. So now we're asking with this uh, law, uh, the process will begin even at school. And uh, so, so the voter registration forms have to be made available uh, to, to high schoolers now. Uh, this takes effect uh, July 1st, uh, 2024. And the goal is to encourage young people to participate in democracy and for schools to begin to uh, talk to students about uh, uh, voter engagement, civic engagement. And the last one uh, that I'll speak about tonight is uh, prohibition of forum shopping. And so uh, this basically prohibits forum shopping where uh, you basically shop around for a judge that you believe uh, will uh, judge, you know, be more favorable to your position uh, when there are constitutional challenges for election law. So it means that constitutional challenges to the law, election law, and any related statutory claims must be brought in a venue where at least one plaintiff is located. So if you're living in Brooklyn uh, and the incident occurred in Brooklyn, you can't go uh, uh, file um, a lawsuit in Ithaca, New York. Uh, and the purpose is to end games, gamesmanship in election law litigation, where folks file frivolous, frivolous lawsuits uh, that help to stabilize, destabilize our democracy. And uh, that essentially brings me to the end. Uh, I have my uh, information up here. Uh, if you need to get in touch with me, if you have any questions that I'm unable to answer tonight, uh, please feel free to contact me. If you have, uh, if, if you wanna hear about uh, my work in public uh, campaign financing, which I did not speak about tonight, I'll be happy to come back uh, at a later date and delve into that um, a little bit more. And with that, I will, I thank you so much for having me and I will stop sharing and turn back. Okay, uh, Karen, just work. one, one question for you. We have none in the chat yes. at the moment. I think a lot of people here are very, pretty well versed on many of these voting reforms, but do you see or do you know if there will be any issues with implementation um, or you know, financing, et cetera, so that these will be on track for when they're expected and you know, it'll be a smooth transition into these reforms? Uh, so I, I I don't think that there'll be any issues really, other than with the early vote by mail. It is in litigation. Uh, the moment that it was signed into law, a uh, lawsuit was filed by the, some Republicans challenging yeah. uh, the constitutionality. Uh, so we, uh, we're hoping that, uh, you know, we will, as in the pro-voting uh, position will prevail, uh, and this would be a system that is available to all New Yorkers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Catherine, I guess back to you, or is it to Catherine Levy? I'll, I'll, I'll take over at the moment, and then we'll pass okay. it along. 
Um, Karen, thank you so much for your time and appreciate your offer to come back and talk to us uh, about other aspects of voting. I mean, I just want to underscore how important all these uh, changes have been to opening up voting for all New Yorkers. It's a, a real win for us all, and but there are still more, uh, I guess, uh, challenges to to address going forward. So, thank you. Um, at this point, we're going to shift our focus uh, from voting to the candidates forum, and so we're going to have each of the candidates, as I said before give a, a brief overview, brief introduction to, as to who they are and to discuss just, just briefly their campaign challenges. We're going to go in this order. We're going to start with the supervisor candidate, Maria Moore. Then we will pivot to East Hampton and ask Tom Flight to uh, speak. Michael will be third and then Ann Welker. Hopefully by that point, will be here and join us. And so she will be able to introduce herself. So Maria, if you don't mind unmuting yourself and uh, we welcome you to Pierce meeting and we'd love to hear about your background and your campaign. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, I, I am Maria Moore and I'm running for Southampton Town Supervisor. I'm currently the mayor of West Hampton Beach and I'm in my 10th year in that position. And it's truly been a privilege to be in a position to affect positive change in the village. Before I became mayor, I was um, active in my community. I was on my library board for 10 years and uh, as part of that time acted as the treasurer. And at, at the same time, I was a volunteer for Maureen's Haven, which is a homeless organization, a local homeless organization on the East End. And I was the coordinator. And what we do is we provide volunteers for uh, in different houses of worship during the winter months for the homeless people. So my job was to get the volunteers to come in and cook the meals and stay overnight and make the breakfasts. And it was very rewarding getting to know the, the people that came and to offer them assistance and um, when I left my job in the city, I was commuting in and um, my husband and I have lived in West Hampton for about 26 years now. We raised our family here and um, I just kept seeing things that I thought needed to be fixed and addressed and didn't understand why they why the village wasn't doing it. So that's what prompted me to run for mayor. And um you know, it's really all about you know, the more I spoke with people, I went door to door and I listened to what they were concerned about. And they seemed very eager and excited for a change of leadership. And um, it's been just all about doing the research, putting plans together and executing on them and listening to people and working collaboratively. I have to say the focus has been a lot on the environment in our village and the changes that have occurred in the last 10 years. We uh, reconstructed our main street and we did, we included a lot of wonderful environmental features in the project. Uh, for example, the, the storm drains under the street were a hundred years old and they were in danger of collapsing. And so we excavated the entire street and put in new storm drains. And while we were doing that, we put in some features for the, um, uh, they're called hydrodynamic separators. They're big units that for the storm rain runoff that filters out the pollutants before it gets to the, the water bodies. And we also put in permeable pavers and LED lighting. And we just made sure that we were doing things that were really going to help the environment. In addition to pedestrian safety features like traffic circles and raised crosswalks and um and uh, curb extensions. And, and so in addition to that, we also worked on implementing a sewer system because uh, the village had been talking about it for about 50 years. And we did a study with Professor Gobler from Stony Brook and he indicated that if we did put the sewers in, it would reduce the nitrogen to the bays by about 24%, which is 5,000 pounds a year. So with that, armed with that information, we met with the community and we were able to make them understand how important the project was. And because of those environmental improvements that would occur, uh, we were eligible for a lot of funding from New York State and the town and the county. 
And um, it's really the my experience has been to work collaboratively with people. And it's really remarkable what you can accomplish when you, you know, meet and um, share goals and work together and bring all arms of the government together to work. And uh, so that's, you know, what I've been working on the last 10 years, and we've been successful with that. There was also a, an asphalt plant in our in our village that uh, was very distressing for people because it was leaving a lot of uh, black silt on their vehicles and their homes. And when I first got elected, there was litigation involving that. And um, I was able to work with the attorneys when I came in to push the, the case to a conclusion. The asphalt company wanted to uh, wanted a, quite a lot of money to settle it, and we didn't think it was appropriate to pay them. And we pushed it, and before the trial came, they ended up, you know, closing up shop. And so um, that was a very important win for the environment and the community. Um, I, you know, I'm happy to take questions. I don't. Uh, well, is there time for that or? At this point, we're going to pause, uh, but, you know, thank you for that. Uh, just one quick question, though. Would you, in a minute, maybe share your campaign's challenges that, as you perceive them, um, you know, to three weeks before election? Well, it's, you know, it's difficult to uh, um, communicate positions in little sound bites. So that's why forums like this are so important where the community participates. And so that, and there have been other debates that are uh, very important to get the word out. It's challenging to um, get people motivated to get out to vote. So I know everybody on our team has been out knocking on doors and reminding people of the importance and, and our uh, party leader, Gordon here has been helping us coordinate with mailings and, um, you know, newspaper ads. But I think that that that's the critical thing is is getting financing for the campaign and also getting people boots on the ground to get out there and remind people to vote. Great, great. So thank you, Maria. So now we're going to ask Tom if he would introduce himself and talk about his campaign challenges. Hello, good evening, and thank you. Um, sorry, it's been a crazy day today. I had to pick my daughter up from urgent care, so it's um. It's a uh, little stress when I first got on the call. Um, and I just wanted to thank Karen very quickly because I thought that presentation was fantastic. And thank you for doing the work you're doing to ensure we get the vote out. Uh, you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not originally from America. I, I grew up in London in England, um, but I had the fortune of meeting my wife um, 20 odd years ago uh, in Edinburgh in Scotland. And uh, we got married scandalously young and we moved back to the US and we lived on the uh, West Coast for some time. And then we managed to come back and settle in Montauk. Um, so uh, that's how I came to be out on the East End. Um, from a professional perspective, um, before moving out here, my career was in corporate strategy and finance. So I was at Gap where I was in charge of the market planning um, for all the Old Navy, Gap, Banana Republic stores across the US and understanding interactions between how they operate, look at socio-demographic records to understand how to best deploy the company's resources. Um, from there, I got uh, headhunted to go to Walmart where I was given the same job looking into introducing small format grocery stores um, into urban areas in the US. Um, Walmart at the time was very concerned. There was a company called Tesco coming over um, who were looking to target a market they'd done very successfully in the UK. And um, you know they, they felt that was a corporate risk. So I wanted to look at doing these stores. Um, it, was a, it was a long story. They really weren't behind it um, in the way they should have been, but gave great insight into you know how, when approached from a strategic perspective, planning, urban planning, and proper analysis can really help us as a community provide the best resources. Um, you know, it, it, there is a science to it um, and there's a skill set to it. Um, but long story short, I, I went to Ann Taylor. Um, it's a long story, but 
I was, I was, I was offered a job in Germany, but um, ended up working for Ann Taylor in New York City. Um, I was head of finance for their internet outlet uh, and credit card divisions. Um, it was a, it was a tough time, honestly. It was right after two thousand eight, the Lehman Brothers crash. I was commuting in from Westchester. We just had our second kid, and um, you know, I, I got offered the opportunity to buy a business out of Montauk. Um, and I, I fell in love with the place. Um, I have a bookstore, I have a clothing store. Um, I, I became a citizen in 2015 and um, I immediately joined the local fire department because that was a requirement and I'd been a critical care EMT for eight years there. Uh, I joined the local school board. Um, I coach soccer teams. I, I coach a men's rugby team because I think the importance of having male mentors out there for young men is critical right now. Um, I, I love my community. It's uh, I, I serve it as best I can. Um, you know, I, we, we have so many issues we're facing out here. Um, we have this incredible environment, but we also have an economy that um, no young local person realistically can envision a future where they can live out here. Um, so it's this very strange kind of place to live. Um, very few people can honestly afford to live here. I, I have two businesses. Um, you know, I will keep him if successfully elected um, to run for town board. I simply have to. I have a, a senior about to enter college. I have two more kids to go to college. It, it's, it's a strange place to live, but I'll be damned. We, we have to do our best to ensure we maintain it as best we can. Um, the environment out here is incredible. I'm fortunate. I go swimming every day. I was in my short shorts swimming today in the, in the sound because the wind was coming from the south today. Otherwise, I go in the ocean. It's incredible. The, the physical beauty, the cleanliness of the environment out here, the responsibility I have, I feel, is like um, being elected representative to East Hampton Town is immense. Um, but, um, it, it, it's it's really something I, I cherish. Um, as I cherish the community, I'm here. I'm here to help everyone. I look to have the same approach I do in EMS, which is if someone calls me up, I don't care who you are, I don't care what your politics are, I will do my best to help you as best I can with the, the realm to the law and my protocols. Um, you know, it, it's, it's it's a function. That's how I play out the school board. But I do it with empathy. Um, I, I think okay. that's lacking in so much of the leadership we see out there today. And I think, you know, listening, understanding people's problems is critical. A lot of people have a lot of issues going on, be it mental health or just the chaotic lifestyles we're forced to lead today. Um, so I, it's really how I try and conduct myself across all fronts you know anytime i have a mentor meeting with um, a youth from the school for ltv projects i do the, the, the key message i leave them with is, is that manners are everything um I, I i do believe that i think it's critical in how we conduct ourselves in society today thanks um, tom i'm gonna i'm gonna, just gonna sure. uh, hop in here because we'll have a time for questions and answers later but we want to make the candidates to first introduce themselves so uh, we're going to go now to michael uh, iaselli who is a southampton town board candidate michael please unmute yourself Thank you, uh, Catherine and Karen. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, very informative. Hello, progressive East End reformers. Michael Iasilli again. It's good to see you all. Um, you know, um, I've told you, many of you, uh, about uh, sort of what, about myself and, and what really got me involved here, but I'll kind of go through some things again. And I've been an, an activist and a political organizer. I'm an academic. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I decided to run because this place, Southampton, means so much to me and means so much to my family. Um, you know, many people that I speak to on a daily basis, uh, whether it's going door to door, whether it's visiting businesses or talking to people on the phone, um, they tell me that they feel like they're losing control of their communities. Um, they're losing control of their future. They see a declining quality of life. Uh, for working people, Southampton is becoming more and more difficult. And I see myself uh, being an elected labor leader, um, being somebody who has fought for the environment, for, fought for the special needs community, I see myself as an individual who will be able to advocate 
for uh, people who are really just trying to make ends meet here in Southampton, long-term residents, residents who are just trying to start out their lives here. Uh, like myself and my wife, we're living in our home um, here in Noyak. This, this house in Noyak was my grandparents' house. They purchased it in the 1960s. Um, and I'm, I'm really privileged to have this, uh, this home here. Um, a lot of folks won't wouldn't have this opportunity if it weren't for my grandparents. So this this race for me is personal uh, because of what it means to me and what I have today. Um, that being said, I was an elected labor leader with the Faculty Association of Suffolk Community College, uh, where uh, we work to provide uh, more of a voice to adjuncts, uh, the rank and file mem members of our union. Um, and and I had I had been elected right before the pandemic, and um, when the pandemic hit, a lot of our uh, uh, constituents were feeling like they were going to lose their jobs. Many of their courses got cut. I advocated for them. Um, when it came to the special needs community, I was appointed to the uh, Brookhaven Town Disability Task Force. And uh, I helped uh, work on creating annual seminars with uh, elected leaders and advocates so we could connect residents to special needs services because a lot of those services are actually really difficult to find. But when you have somebody in government that is connecting residents to the programs, people begin to have faith in government again. You know, Maria Moore mentioned something about collaboration and making sure you get people to the table. I believe I see myself in my role as a labor leader, uh, an advocate for the special needs community, and as in my role today as legislative aide to Bridget Fleming, where I've worked on key environmental uh, policies, such as protecting the Long Pond Green Belt. Um, we worked on housing legislation, transportation. Um, if we are committed to working with all members of our community and uplifting the voices of everyday working people, I believe that we can really reach a new horizon in Southampton where everybody can thrive. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. And um, I really hope uh, that, you know, what we can do in the future is, is continue to, to, to see how we can improve um, our environment, our bays, our waterways, which are certainly seeing a decline because of overdevelopment, um, because of the need for septic improvement. My time in the Suffolk County Legislature has, has really yielded some knowledge of how to actually connect people to the septic improvement grants, which is really critical because the Suffolk County Legislature failed to ensure that we can have a countywide sewer district. So in the meantime, we need somebody who knows how to get people connected to the right services in government so we could make sure we're moving our communities in the right direction. Now, that being said, um, I want to just mention that uh, the challenges that our I think our campaigns are facing is this. Um, look, this is good. This is an off year election. Um, I believe that it's going to be a low turnout. We really need to do what we can to get out the vote. Um, you know, when I go to people's doors and you know in Noyak or in in, in Hampton Bays, they they don't even know an election's coming. So we need to make sure that we're telling folks, look, there's an election coming up. You know, it's important to get yourself out, also get your family members out, and get your 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 siblings out. So I think really right now what we should be doing is we should just be trying to figure out how we get the word out of this election, inform the folks about uh, our candidates running, and I think that we'll do do a good job if we can do all of that. Well said, Michael. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, that's what it's all about, getting people to the polls to vote. It's all about turnout. Um, so now we're going to go over to Ann Welker, who has joined us in, in progress. And if you want to unmute yourself and give us a little of your background and talk about your campaign challenges, that'd be great. Hi, everybody. So nice to see all of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. Isn't that an amazing slate of candidates that you've just heard from? Like one after the other is just amazing. It takes courage to run for elected office and each to each of you who are candidates at this time or perhaps some of you on this call who have been candidates in the past, you know how difficult it is, especially in these last 19 days so we just have to <laughs> we just have to hang in there for 19 days but these are the most important days um i said yes to uh 
running for Suffolk County Legislature um, back in February. And pretty much since that day, um, I've had my foot all the way to the floor on um, with the gas. Um, it's it's a long run. It's it's a lengthy time, but um, after serving as a Southampton Town Trustee for six years, um, I felt that this next step, when it was offered to me, was um, was an important one. The ability to take what I've learned as a trustee and take it with me to the county legislature and be able to help those um, that to just to be able to build some bridges. I think that's the important thing. I was able to build bridges as a trustee working with my board, and I look forward to being able to do that at the county level as well. Um, the it was particularly concerning there was an unfortunate vote that took place in july that will be one of my priorities to work on the suffolk county water quality restoration tax the the implementation of that tax the the act of moving forward advancing of that tax is critically important to sustaining the funding for the upgrades for our innovative alternative septic systems that is water quality is what brought me out from under my rock <laughs> to run for trustee and um, it's something that um, it got me involved um, at uh, with water testing for surf rider with the blue water task force many years ago and it has it's keeping me going now to be able to move on to this next perhaps move on to this next level um the challenges that i see with the campaign if you had asked me this question back in mm, april or may when I had $200 in my war chest, <laughs> I would have said funding. Um, thank goodness things started to roll with that. And I have been most fortunate. Um, we do have a fundraiser coming up next Tuesday at Oakland's and Hampton Bays. Um, just in order to... Um, I'm not as well known in the western portion of Southampton Town and in East Hampton Town. So this is to reach across to the Hampton Bays, East Quag, and West Hampton folks so to get our get our uh, name out over there. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward to Tuesday night. If you had asked me over the course of the past week and a half, what was my most critical challenge, I would have said my debating skills. Um, I've been mentioning that in high school, if perhaps I had, um, I had been on the debate team rather than on the track team, that would have served me well. But I managed to make it through the Newsday editorial interview um, with my opponent, um, and then through, luckily through the League of Women Voters um, debate on, on this past week as well, I I was able to to listen to and respond to the questions better with each time. So I'm happy that I was able to see some progress um, within myself. So. Now, the most challenging thing is probably in, as has been said before this evening, in these off year elections, it's to get out the vote. Each of you tonight who's taken the time to be here to listen to this amazing slate of candidates, to hear our ideas, our thoughts, our visions, you're an ambassador. My win number, the number of votes that it's going to take for me to, to win in between Southampton and East Hampton towns is between 8,500 and 9,000 votes. That's a lot of doors. That's a lot of hands to shake. That's a lot of concerns to hear. So if you would each this evening consider yourself an ambassador for each of us, for Maria, for Tom, 
for Michael. Three amazing candidates, and each of us needs your help sharing our vision. So thank you so much for this opportunity to speak tonight. I look forward to any questions that might be forthcoming. Thank you, Anne. And I posted in the chat, you might not see because you may be on a cell phone that, you know, your track experience will give you the stamina to finish strong at, uh, as, as the race ends. So, and, and we're here as ambassadors for you. Um, and thank you all for, for introducing yourselves. We have a few question that, uh, questions that members of PEER are going to now uh, post to the group. And I believe T. Latroge, who is on the PEER Corps, is going to start. Uh, Tila, can you unmute yourself and begin? Yes, hi, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Um, my question goes out to each candidate. I would like to know what action you can commit to taking tonight um, to protect actively the water quality um, around Long Island. Um, and also what you will do to reduce actively the amount of nitrates that are in the water. Teela, you want to have one person start with that? Um, yes. Um, can we start with Tom? What? I'd be happy to start if you don't I'm, mind. I'm, I'm good. Whatever she, whatever oh, Taylor would Tom? like. Whatever is Taylor's preference, sorry. Tom, go for it. Sure. Okay. Um, so what actions would I commit to put quality around on? I'm gonna come at this from a local perspective immediately. Um, you know, because that's where I would have jurisdiction to kind of make a change. Um in my hamlet of Montauk, we are fortunate to have the second largest body of fresh water pond on Long Island. Um we, we've seen the water quality in there dramatically diminish um, during our peak tourism seasons um, to the point that there's algal blooms cropping up. I would absolutely pledge that the next project that I'd be pushing to get done in Montauk environmentally would be to introduce bioswales into that water body and at any, any other entrance in town where we believe there to be um, extensive pollution going into our water bodies. Um, you know, in terms of reducing nitrates very specifically, um, you know, the use and the promotion of the CPF fund we have out here to uh, increase and enhance our use of IA systems, I think would be critical. I also think in that realm, we need some blue sky thinking and, um, you know, there's opportunities to explore uh, more implementation of recycling of gray water for irrigation opportunities, even at the private house level. Um, you know, it's blue sky, it's out there, but I, I genuinely believe that with the resources we have and the skill sets we have of people out here, there is opportunity for us to become, you know, leaders in water quality protection. Um, it's something I, I would do, and it's something that, you know, it's an industry that I would like to push and preserve. Um, I don't know if you read a few months ago, or sorry, a bit longer, actually, um, there was a paper done by the Newsday group called the... the um, the blue economy effectively for Long Island kind of discussing how, um, you know, that is really how we as a larger community need to be positioning ourselves, um, build, building industries around um, protection and enhancement of our water quality out here. Um, we live in a phenomenal place. Uh, we need to be doing everything we can to protect it. Does that answer enough? That's okay? great. Yes, thank you. Should we go to Maria Mornick? Sure, thank you for the question. There are two communities, two hamlets in our town that are uh, specifically in very much need of sewering. And one is um, Hampton Bays and the other is Riverside. And the plans have been talked about for at least a decade. And um, I would want to dig in and do for those two communities what I did in, in West Hampton Beach. Um, I would also uh, vigorously continue with setting aside community preservation fund money, take a certain amount off the top to make sure that the IA systems for the town are funded. Awesome. 
Awesome. Thank you. Um, Ann Welker. Hi. How are you, Teela? Great to see you. Thank um, you. Good to see you. So I'm going to come at this from um, two different points of view. Um, one would be streamlining the um, innovative alternative septic um, grant process um, the, at the both with the CPF and there's one one application that's necessary for the CPF. Um, grant and then there's another that's necessary for the county and the state if we were able to somehow streamline that because I seem to hear over and over how difficult it is for people to get through this process as individuals there are a couple companies that are helping with this as consultants but I think we can do better and make it be more more user friendly to attain this grant funding. Um, there is um, there's hope for that, I think, but it's a super important process. The other thing that um, I'm going to take a, a deep look at, there was um, legislation that was passed at the state level. I believe it was in December for uh, that will allow um, the Suffolk County Aquaculture Lease Program for Peconic and Gardner's Bay to, it will allow those aqua, aquaculturists to be able to grow kelp. So shellfish grow, oysters grow um, in the summer months, but kelp is a winter project, Tila, as you well know. And this would uh, the but however the problem is that in new york state dec doesn't yet have a permitting process for this i have worked extensively with dec um as a trustee with um the with mecox bay with sag pond with mill pond and i hope that some of my connections there will help me to be able to move that permitting forward because in speaking with or in reading and speaking with oyster farmers, they say that this is going to be a several year process to get through all this bureaucratic red tape. So whatever I can do to help on that end, I'm, I'm so dedicated to it. Um, New York is it's estimated depends on who you speak with, but it's estimated that we're about 30 years behind Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Maine in terms of, in terms of oyster farming. So I, I, I like to catch us up a little. Sounds great. Um, Michael? <clears throat> Thank you, Tila. Um, great question. Nice to see you. Um, so, so yeah, so, so first of all, I think we need to start off by saying that our economy is heavily reliant on the health of our bays and waterways. So this is such an important issue, not just for obviously the, the importance of keeping our, our, our water clean, but also for ensuring the sustainability of our local economy. Um, so there are two things. I mentioned earlier about the septic improvement grant process that the county runs. I'd like to um, work on integrating um, a periodic seminar at the town um, for residents to become informed of the, uh, the, the, the grant application process for septic improvement and IA applications. So that's an important thing. You know, a lot of people, you know, if they are aware that, that it exists, great, but there are people who are not plugged into government that just don't know. And I think that if more people know, more people will do it, especially out here in Southampton, where people might have a little extra income where they're, you know what, they have a, they have a, a home that, that can be suitable for an IA they might be willing to go through the process. Um, and it's a great process because they receive $10,000 in grant funds. And if they can qualify, they can receive up to five to, to 10 more additional thousand dollars as well. So that's a really important thing. Um, so I look at maybe having the Department of Health Services, somebody from the county DHS, come in and give a presentation um, on a periodic basis at the town and, and ensure that our council members are doing what they can to inform 
um, their residents of, of the process. That's number one. Um, Number two, I'd really, I really, I think it's important that we advance our nitrogen reduction initiatives as well as carbon capture initiatives. And as you know, Tila, and as Anne referenced, the kelp program um, that the Shinnecock kelp farmers are leading is really just as successful. They're showing successful gains, and I think we need to do more to partner with the nation to become informed on how that process works and how we could replicate it across our other water bodies to improve uh, the health of uh, the aquaculture. Because we are seeing a regeneration in various uh, 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 marine life that is really important for the sustainability, sustainability of our waterways. Um, also, Cornell Cooperative Extension has, has been doing great work with uh, eelgrass restoration and showing how they're reversing scallop die off I think that that is really, really critically important for us to move forward on. Now, the way we can probably expand these programs, which I think is important, is tapping into, yes, our CPF, which is going to be important for us. And, and it's great that we have a lot of money going in there. So let's use a lot of it up uh, for this. But at the same time, let's also tap into that 4.2 billion in the New York State Environmental Bond Act. That's there for a reason. Let's tap into those funds. Let's get those funds to do more of this work. I think we have the opportunity now. Those funds aren't going to last forever. So I'm willing to do the work partnering with Assemblyman Fred Thiel, Senator Palumbo, whoever it is, um, to make sure that we're able to get the funds necessary to do what the nation is doing and also what Cornell Cooperative is doing. I think there's a lot of great work that we need to be expanding and utilizing to ensure uh, water quality here in the region. Awesome, thank you. Great. So th thank you, Tila, and, and thank you candidates for really terrific responses. And for those of you on the call who don't know, I imagine most of you do, Tila is a founding member of the Shinnecock Kelp Farmers and they are doing innovative work here locally, regionally, and nationally to you know, try to help lead us forward in, in the midst of our climate crisis. So at, at this moment, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine Levy, who has a question, I believe, on transportation. I'm so grateful that these terrific candidates have talked about how difficult it is for working people to sustain a, a, a decent life here. And I think that one of the greatest challenges that working people face are our terrible and ever worsening traffic and transportation problems. So can you identify what are the most serious problems and how we might address them? And I know that Michael has thought a lot about this, so I'll begin with him. It's so funny. I never thought that I would be the traffic <laughs> individual, <laughs> but it just so happens this is how it's materializing. Um, but look, you know, I, I only I only started talking about traffic because when I started going door to door, everybody said, oh, the traffic issues are getting worse. Democrat, Republican, unaffiliated, it doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum, it's affecting all of us. And so I really do think we need to do something about traffic. So let me explain to you what I've I've thought of, which is establishing a traffic mitigation task force um, to uh, hear from local folks. A task force can be set up like a local committee uh, that allows uh, our elected officials to hear from the public. Because what I think sometimes we do, we move three steps ahead without actually listening to people. We think we know what the problem is without actually really doing the, the work of, of listening to folks and identifying the real problem. So I, I, I want to start a task force um, so that we can hear from some, some local folks because you know, it's not just County Road 39, that's a main artery, but it's also Hill Street, you know, it's roads in Flanders, it's it's in Riverside. I mean, there there are lots of problem corridors, it's Noyak Road, lots of problem corridors where there's traffic uh, safety issues, where there are speeding cars, and then there's traffic congestion issues. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to make sure that we are uh, finding ways to mitigate some of the, the, the traffic congestion and ways to keep families safe on the road. Um, I, I don't have a one size fits all answer to this, but that's what the task force is all about. So we can actually find some solutions. Um, part of the solution has to be, of course, um, uh, expanding train service. 
We need to make sure we're working with Assemblyman Thiel and Senator Palumbo to make sure that we're able to expand the South Fork, Fork commuter connection. I know that they worked hard with Legislator Bridget Fleming's help to expand Friday service and weekends, but we got to really expand it further um, because it is a popular um, it's a popular mode of, of transportation, especially for teachers, actually. Um, so let's try to see how we could do that in addition. We also have uh, something that Legislator Fleming uh, uh, unveiled in the last couple of years, which is the Suffolk On Demand bus, which is essentially, it's a public transportation bus that runs between Sag Harbor Village to Southampton Village at $2.25 a ride. It's a nice service. It's like a ride sharing app. You call up the bus, it picks you up at the, the nearest cross street. You get on the bus and you go to wherever you want to go. It's currently running Monday through Friday. They're they're thinking of adding weekend service, but I'd like to see this this service expanded through, throughout more places in the town. I hear people that want to use it for, for getting to doctor's appointments or getting to the grocery store in Bridgehampton. So there are a lot of different um, things that I think we need to be doing to expand access to transportation, which will reduce cars on the road, it'll reduce CO2 emissions, and we can get this traffic crisis a little bit under control. So again, I think that we need a traffic mitigation task force, we need to expand public transportation services, and I'll also say this, I think we need to figure out how to enhance some housing um, east of the canal um, that doesn't add to the density, that's number one, but actually allows for, for folks who, who work here to actually be able to commute to and from work, um, go home, go to work. Um, I, I would look at the dorms in, in uh, Southampton Stony Brook, uh, which have been abandoned for quite some time. Um, I'd be willing to work with Assemblyman Thiel. The I think he needs uh, supporters at the town level to and the county to help move this process forward because we need to actually negotiate with SUNY to try to get this to 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 not be dorms abandoned dorms anymore and and maybe push it to workforce housing. Let's try to do that. I also do have a housing proposal, but we won't get to that. We'll save that for later. Um, Anne, do you have something to add about transportation and traffic? Sure. Sometimes you have to look at the low hanging fruit and and going after that and what i've been thinking about is county road 39 and what are some fairly simple things that could be done there to just make things a bit safer and it's not getting traffic off the road or anything like that but it is making things safer we need a left-hand turn signal at the light at the college as you're heading east at tuckahoe road and we need a left-hand turn signal at tuckahoe school those would be two fairly easy things that i believe can be done at the county level that um, would definitely make things i know that when I turn left at, at, at either of those intersections, I mostly, I don't turn left. I turn right. I go over the railroad tracks at the college. I turn around and I sit at Tuckahoe Road facing north until the light changes. And then I go straight across. That, you know, that seems like it should be a fairly simple fix. I don't know, but it's an idea. The second thing is to look at the sinking of the lights on County Road 39 to make sure that they all turn at the same time so that when the traffic flows, it flows. That again, um, working with De Suffolk County Department of Public Works should be an easy thing to go after, hopefully. And hopefully it can be done or at least investigated to make sure that if the lights are not now are not presently synced, they could be. Um, to just follow up on the, the train situation, an idea that's been bandied about for decades, I'm learning, is that of a scoot train. So the South Fork commuter connection is amazing, but it doesn't hit all of the people that it could because it only runs morning and evening. So a scoot train, um, you would need, it's two cars, and you would need um, to repair or replace the antiquated sidings that exist in Bridgehampton and Wainscott, 
perhaps someplace a little bit further west too. And that would allow two trains to pass because that's the problem now. There's just one track. But a scoot train with two trains could go back and forth all day. And linking that up to the shuttle that presently exist that would give workers at town hall at the hospital and in the schools another avenue to get some cars off the road though those are the two things that that um i really think are super well no there's one more if we could have if we could get a little bit more um going in the way of bike lanes in safe areas that would be incredibly important too. I know that there's a planner in Southampton Town that is now working, uh, or a former planner in Southampton Town that's now working for the New York Public Lands Trust, I believe is the name of that organization, but he's working on bike lanes. He made a difference in, in Hampton Bays because he put together a loop there with... Um, rental bicycles and it worked well people use it the bicycles in Southampton Village people use and that's not necessarily getting our east west traffic off the road but it makes a difference over time so thank you for that great question it's an important topic thank you Thank you, Anne. You, you, all of you have too many good ideas and we have too little time. Um, so Maria, I'm gonna ask you the same question. I just, just urge you and Tom to be brief because I know there are many pressing questions that we want to ask you before we have to disperse. Maria, you're on mute, Maria. All you're right. on mute. Thank you. Um, you know, I have to echo a lot of what Anne and Michael said. It's getting the cars as many off the road by bus services, increasing that and increasing the train service and Assemblyman Thiel's done a great job. And, and I know we're all continuing to advocate with the Long Island Railroad for additional train service. I think that um, what Ann was saying about traffic safety is very important too, that we have to slow it down because it's so difficult to, to make turns off the main road. And if we could add some digital, uh, speed cameras and some additional police enforcement of the speed zones that would make things safer for everybody. I think tra traffic circles are an effective way to move traffic along. And, um, you know, also if we can get some uh, affordable housing in the Hamlet centers, it would reduce the need for cars that people could live and work and shop within a walking distance from their home. And, um, oh, there was one other thing I was gonna say and I can't remember what it is. Well, well you, could, you could go back to it during maybe the <laughs> um, So Tom, if from, so the, ideas, uh, right? from the perspective of East Hampton and Montauk in particular. Yeah, no, and listen, I, I think, you know, they, they've covered a lot of this, which is, you know, we, we need to invest in public transport. We need to invest in bike paths. Um, you know, I, I, I'm I'm for all of that. There's one other aspect of transport I just want us to think about too, all of us going forward is, um, you know, one of the things I'm looking at with East Hampton specifically is our emergency preparedness plans. Um, God forbid there is a big fire up here and it's a very real threat with the peak with the dead trees out there right now. Um, how are we getting people out, truthfully, or, or any other coastal emergency there is? Um, I, I drive the ambulance, it can be crazy. It, it, it's ridiculous. and. We, we need to kind of all ensure as leaders within our different areas that the interaction between districts and levels of government to ensure that that plan is working is a critical part of all our jobs for transportation. So uh, I just, that's the only thing I'm gonna add. Thank you very much. I think uh, Catherine has a question now, don't you? Catherine Soka? Yeah, yeah. great. Thank you, Catherine, Catherine Levy. And thanks again to the candidates for their uh, responses. Um, I was doing a little fall cleaning today and I came across an article from 2008 and it's an editorial entitled Affordable Housing, The Last Good Chance. The article was about the Bull of a Watch Case factory in Sag Harbor where the county by law could have put 20% of the units that went in there as affordable, which would have given us about 19 units in downtown Sag Harbor of community housing for teachers, essential workers, and the like. 
So my question, and everyone has already touched on the, the ab absolute crisis that we have in housing. Uh, there's a desperate need for housing for teachers, for nurses, um, for retail workers. I'm a small business owner as well. But then on the flip side of that, um, there's a need, there's a rampant supersizing of luxury housing that is maxing out lot sizes, um, and it's gobbling up resources like water, energy, and the treatment of the lawns is adding to chemicals to the, the nitrate uh, crisis in the bays. So I'd like to hear from each of you what really what one or two specific code changes or amendments that you could put in at the town or the county level that would encourage more affordable units while reducing the impact of the excessive luxury development that we have. And for those who are running for town office, I would like you to also include how you can maximize the use of the uh, community housing fund and when you feel you'll be able to see the town start to um, use that and have an impact. Um, I'd like to start with Anne because I started with a reference to the county and what the county, if I can say, failed to do in the Bull of the Watch Case Factory, which to, in my way of thinking has really, really started the emergency uh, housing issue in Sag Harbor. So Anne, please. I was not aware of that, Catherine, and that is so disappointing to hear um, because every single unit matters. So fast forward, that was 2008, I believe you said, right? Fast forward 15 years. Um, it, that's almost embarrassing to, uh, to, to reflect upon that, that mistake. But so looking at things now, um, the septic systems that um, upgrading septics and addressing septic um, is an important part of all of this. And I think that's something that that's a, a real focus of mine is streamlining that septic, because I believe that we have pool houses, we have um, attached garages, we have guest houses, if there's the possible, or, or um, garages that might have the possibility to play, to do a small um, a studio or a loft situation overhead. Um, that's where we need to look um, to expand those because with, um, it doesn't, it increases the, the density, but only a bit. So I think that's an important part of this, tying it into the county and the septic. I also think that, um, you know, there, I don't know if any of you saw the film, um, One Big Home. It was um, made by, right? I think, you know, that carpenter from Martha's Vineyard that took 12 years to make that film he was really he was uh, he was ahead of his time it was shown out here several times but it wasn't uh, and I went to see it a couple times because he traveled with it frequently and he spoke and it wasn't until I saw it in Orient and he he zoomed in because he was no longer traveling with the film it wasn't until I saw it in Orient with a packed room that it really made such a difference because that's when the town of Southhold really went after their zoning and looked at restricting the zoning, the size of the zoning as is now being looked at in many situations. But that's, uh, that's more a town issue, but I just wanted to remind you of that film, One Big Home. So septic is what I'll be looking at. Great, thank you. I mean, it's a regional issue too that needs to be looked at from the uh, legislate, the county as well as the towns. Uh, but Maria, if you wouldn't mind tackling that question for us, we'd appreciate it. Sure, thanks. I would I'll just make sure I'm not muted again. <laughs> I would uh, make sure that the, or, or help to make sure that the community housing fund in the town uses their resources that, you know, it's a new program. There's not a lot of money accumulated yet, but it'll happen quickly with all the transfers of property that occur in the town. 
And I'd like to see some of that used for a down payment to help first time home buyers and also funding to rehabilitate um, you know, the zombie homes and funding for accessory dwelling units so that people can uh, share their homes and also get income. So creating housing and helping the homeowner. Um, uh, with respect to the abuse of the water um, for irrigation, you know, it's always shocking to me when the local newspaper publishes the worst offenders. And it's incredible, you know, how much is being used and it's a shared resource. And um, we've, I've, you know, I've spoken with representatives from the Suffolk County Water Authority as to how to regulate that. This, you know, and they've encouraged every municipality to pass zoning codes to limit it at least odd even days. And, and uh, the, there's a little problem with the enforcement of that. But um, I know that they're also talking about raising the rates, having much higher rates, depending on, you know, the more you use, the more you're going to pay. So um, that's a problem. And I would certainly advocate to address at least that part of it. Let, let me ask, and obviously all these issues we're talking about are interrelated, traffic, housing, uh, the environment. But Specifically, what changes might you introduce into the town government or um, another way of looking at it is, is we already have accessory apartment legislation on, on the board, uh, on the books for both towns, but we don't have a lot of, of uh, community accessory apartments being built. Is there a way we can accelerate that or is there some other way we can, you know, with code changes, get more, um, get people to have more of those pool housing or garage apartments built and used? Mm -hmm. uh, code changes to make it uh, more available in, in, in other, in, you know, more districts, but also um, the, there is a program that just recently got started in the town and it's being funded by the state for, it, it's income qualified though, um, that they provide, I think it's $125,000 to the homeowners to convert a part of their home for a separate entrance and a separate unit. And then the town also has funding that they provide for a similar program that's not income qualified. And so there's an educational piece too, getting the information out there to people and making them know that it's available. Great, okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Tom, would you give us East Hampton's perspective, please? Yeah. Um... It's very interesting. I'm going to come this from a personal perspective, first of all. I mean, and just a planning perspective, which is that, um, you know, and I hope Francesca's going to answer your question in the comments. Um, the, the most environmentally friendly way to house people out here is higher density buildings. Um, you know, it, it's environmentally the best way. Is it the best way for us out here? No, because... We, we have a character of community that we are looking to preserve. Um, but I do think the overall strategy is one of increasing housing density. It's a question of how we do it. Um, but it's going to the personal stories, you know, um, my in-laws were faced with um, a position where they could no longer stay in their house, uh, which was in, in my same hamlet. And they were going to have to, move somewhere where they could afford to live. And, and I said, this is crazy. This is your hometown. Um, so we actually built onto our property to help them move in with us. And um, it, it's hugely successful. Bluntly, you know, um, I get to keep an eye on them. Um, they help out with picking up my kids. Um, Multi-family units uh, definitively work, whether it be, you know, what we've done, whether it be a duplex, a, a quadruplex, you know, we, we have to be honest about it. I think as it's done, we've got to take opportunities and push for what is one of the most critical tools we have for fighting water quality. The septic system, of course, has to be redone and it has to be adequate for whatever is going on in there. We have to know that irrespective, we've got cleaner um, residue going into our groundwater. Um, Can I ask you a question, Tom? Just yeah. as a follow up, I mean, would you would you introduce legislation that would have an affordable housing overlay, or I think East Hampton might already have that. I mean, I mean, um, 
sorry, Sim, sorry. one question or two. So I'm gonna have one. Um, honestly, Catherine, I, I can't answer that because I, I I don't know enough to give you a really well informed answer. I have to look more into it, and that that's all I'm gonna say. Um, you know, uh, in terms of the the housing fund, um, you know, how do you use it to get better housing? There's many opportunities. Do you build it up and find properties to do it? Yes, here and the other. I mean, just very locally. Um, one thing that I we we have to work and we have to work again across different levels of government is um Camp Hero in Montauk. It's an old army base. Now, if you travel to San Francisco or many other cities in the US, uh, those old army bases have been converted into mixed unit space. Um, the opportunity for us to do things in those those areas is key and we, we should be pursuing them. So that, you know, there is low, to me, low hanging fruit because I, I see it, but making it happen will be challenging. Um, we have to be pursuing this on every level, but we have to be doing it in a way that, like everything else, is enhancing um, our environment or, or being sustainable with our environment or causing the least damage to our environment. Because right now, um, I don't know if we're doing that um, thoroughly enough, bluntly. Um, so that's it. I, I, I was going to say, um, Two other things on that. One is I, I think that we also need to revisit for every five years, maybe every 10 years, you know, like the CPF fund. Um, you know, do we want to explore whether the it's being used for what we need it to be used for? I, I think um, you know, it, it it's something that's it's building. It's been a phenomenal success having purchased nearly half a billion in, in land um since its inception. Um right. Even from early on, it was a great success. You know, finding ways to do that while enhancing the environment, I think, is key. Um, the, the last one here is is the one that we all face, and, I, and bluntly, we're all guilty of. It's nimbyism, right? How do how do we stop that? Um, I'm sure there are good people who didn't want the 19th. You know, it, it, and we face it across many fronts. It's not just housing. I mean, we in Springs. You know, I, I am. I'm hearing left, right, and center about getting your cell phone coverage up there and how critical it is. And it's true. I, I've had, you know, work I've done up there medically. It's, it's, it's tough. Um, but getting one in is, is the challenge. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's facing it all fronts and, you know, just pushing it through. We're going to have to be bold, bluntly, guys. We're going to have to put our, our feet in the stand and, you know, maybe get burnt on some issues. But if it, it's something we think is critical, we have to push for it. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. So, Michael Iaselli, <clears throat> last on the housing issue. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so, you know, I just want to say, I think we have to be careful when it comes to density, because I think as a coastal community, we have to be aware of our sept our, our limited septic capacity, actually. So that, that's really important. You know, I hear a lot of folks from, and you know, maybe East Hampton is a bit different, but, you know, I hear from people in Hampton Bays, for instance, they, they feel like they're being dumped on with development, you know, and I think, you know, we need to be careful, especially in terms of working class communities that feel like they're being, you know, squeezed together and and um, you know don't have the really the potential to really address their 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 the septic improvement needs, um, which is why we do need, um, I think, a more concerted effort to uh, informing folks of, of various septic improvement uh, opportunities. Um, that said, I I I do want to say that we you know Maria Moore mentioned zombie buildings. I think that's really important. You know, Brookhaven Town with their code enforcement, they have a bit more teeth than Southampton. So, um, you know, they are able to sort of tackle zombie buildings and repurpose them for uh, affordable housing in a much more swift, swift way. I, I'd like to try and identify areas where we have zombie buildings um, and repurpose them uh, with groups like Habitat for Humanity and the Housing Authority, which they do that currently through the 72H program. Um, the 72H program is a really important part of this too. Now that is, it, it's through the state, but also the county, it's a state law, uh, but the county sort of takes those homes uh, that are tax defaulted and they put them off to auction. And when they put them off to auction, the county typically, you know, sells them at market value. And that's great for the county. It helps revenue streams. 
but it's actually um, bad for the towns that that recognize the need for repurposing existing structures um, so that they can actually use them uh, for affordable housing. Um, Southampton is doing a good job, but we, we need to actually streamline that process. If we could find a way to make sure that those 72H parcels are actually provided to the town before they go off to auction, that's a way we can actually do that. And I think using CHF, as uh, Mayor Moore mentioned, as a down payment assistance, or perhaps maybe mortgage assistance um, in some in some way, that might be the way to go um, in conjunction with, with ensuring our partnership with the county helps to streamline those 72H parcels. Um, I do just want to mention also um, that, you know, um, if we do this, we, 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 we need to also recognize the fact that the Southampton Town has not had an updated comprehensive plan since 1997. We don't have a comprehensive plan that's updated. They made some the addendums, which are great. The sustainable the sustainability element that they added in the in 2015 or 16, I think, was great. However, we need to go back to the drawing board so that we could really address some of the zoning issues. I think actually looking to East Hampton town council member Kate Rogers um, and some of the work that she's doing, she's looking to form or she may have already formed a working group that's going to look and assess residential zoning and where needed, they're gonna look at where they could reduce house size or reduce clearing, total lot coverage, uh, the classification of natural grade and low grade development and other sections, we have to address address the, the way in which we go about zoning. And that starts with the comprehensive plan. So I'd really like to look at that as, as, as the next step. Great. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> We're now going to turn to Tina. We have, we have a lightning round for the candidates. Please be brief in your response to Tina's question, and then we will go to questions from the audience. Tina. Okay. If I were to campaign for you, and I, whether it be in person or on the telephone or texting, what would you want me to highlight? That's my question. And anybody could, Michael, why don't you go first? Thank you, Tina. Um, I guess I would love for you to highlight the fact that I'm committed to serving the community. I, I want to be able to serve the community. I, I, it's something that really gives me um, it, it gives me purpose with the, the fact that I can help somebody get connected to an agency or a service that they are in need of. Um, that 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 means that we're we're helping to improve someone's life. So if we can do if if one thing about me is is serving the community, I think helps all of us. So um, that's one of my things that I would like to highlight. And. Sure. I think that I would like to stress, to, I would like you to stress two things. One being my six years as a trustee, as a town trustee, working not only with other members of the board, but also with the town and also with state and federal agencies. Um, I am a connector and um, I feel that moving from town trustee to county, that's gonna be an important aspect of things as I move forward, per, per, hopefully. So that, that would be what I'd like you to stress. Thank you. Um, who's next? Tom? Um, I, I'd hope you'd say you'd like it, you know, but I, we don't know each other personally, but you know, um, look, I I really pride myself on just trying to do the right thing out there. Um, you know, I, Michael hit on it. I think earlier, it's like you you have to love doing the right thing for your community, and uh, you know, you're gonna get it right as much as you can, but you're gonna make decisions in a truly fair way with um, the well being of most people out there. Thank you, Maria. I would want you to say that experience matters and results count and that I have been the mayor for nine years and um, there's been a lot that's been accomplished in our village and I would want to treat each hamlet the way I treated my own village. And um, for me, it's not about politics. It really is community service as it is for everybody that I'm running with. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Tina. Uh, and again, thank you, candidates. Jerry, uh, I'm gonna call on you as our chat monitor. I, I, I think at least Francesca has a question. I'm not sure if there's any others, but- um, Yeah, um, I, I see no others. Um, so Francesca, why don't you go ahead? I believe your question was for Tom. Um, so go ahead, unmute yourselves. Oh, Francesca, are you with it, us? I think it was her earlier question. It says in the chat, it was she wanted to know about my priorities about the environment, affordable housing, and overdevelopment. I think I answered some of that in the question, which is that, you know, bluntly, it's a really tough balance between the three. Um, I, I look at it from this perspective very quickly, which is that, you know, the pandemic showed us one really key thing, which is we, we have an essential population we need for the communities to function out here. And very bluntly, we don't have the housing for them. They, they can't afford to live here without some kind of affordable housing. So we, we need to kind of look to get that in place. Um, and we need to be opportunistic about it. We also need to like look for ways to, for families to to live here more than one generation. Um, I mean, it's it's really rather sad how pretty much every youth I know in this town leaves and doesn't really come back to live here um, because there is so much of the history and the, the knowledge of the importance of the environment um, that is lost. And um, I, I think that's a critical piece. Um, you know, I'll, I'll bluntly just end with this. And I, I think that anyone out here on the East End hopefully has the same message, which is that the environment out here is critical. It is, it's why we all choose to live here. It is the economy. Um, I'm a strong believer that it's an intricately tied to our health uh, and we are very fortunate to live here and we, we have to do our best to protect it. <clears throat> okay, well, well, well yeah. said, um, Jerry, yeah. Jerry, no more I, questions, right? In the no, chat. no, that's it. Right. So listen, we're coming to the close of our meeting, but I think what I'd like to do is to give each candidate, you know, a minute to inform us how we can help with your campaign. Um, drop in chat any links that you might have uh, for us to support you. And let's start with Maria. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a wonderful opportunity. And I would uh, just want to convey that I would do everything I could for the town, same similar to what I've been doing for the village, listening, balancing the interests, working with the community, creating projects and seeing them through and finding grant money to help pay for it. Um, I would put politics aside and, and co coordinate with state and federal and county and local legislators and um, to accomplish what needs to be done. And I'm, I'm here to make a difference. And if you could help get the word out and get people to go to the polls and vote, that would be much appreciated. Great. Thank you, Maria. Um, Tom, how about you next? Um, if you see us out there when we're campaigning, please stop by and say hi. It's, um, it, it's so nice to see a friendly face. Like I, I can tell you, for a lot of candidates I talked to, it takes its toll. Anne, Anne alluded to it earlier. Like it's tough. You're putting yourself on display. You 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 you're kind of you, you are vulnerable in a way, and you know you want to you want to give the right answers. And sometimes you 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 might not get it right, and you sound weird. And it's a very weird environment to do this in Zoom and not in person. So be empathetic um, to the candidates you meet out there. I think they're trying, um, and you know remember that they, they deep down you know, have the well-being of the community out here. Um, you know, right. in terms of getting the vote out there, um, I, I have to say, I guess, I hate all these mailers and lawn signs. Uh, you know, I'm like, I've told my crew, like, if I run again, um, I'm not doing any of that stuff because it's just like, <laughs> it's just waste creation. Um, you know, <laughs> just word of mouth, guys. Please just, just commit to maybe calling up three to five people and asking them to call one more person if they can. Like that, that's what we want. We, we gotta get this voting up. Um, and that's key. So thank you. 
Thanks, Tom. I think you probably just made your campaign manager or a Anna over in East Hampton <laughs> roll her eyes. <laughs> we need lawn signs and somebody even just posted yard signs. So, uh, but anyway, I, we understand um, the, 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 the uh, impulse for saying that. Uh, Anne, how about you next? And then we'll finish with Michael. And post in the chat, you all, how can we help you? Michael's done that. Yeah. You know the way you could help me? My opponent has been writing weekly letters to the East Hampton Star and as well as the Southampton Press, all four editions, um, for months. So if you were so inclined, I believe there are two issues of our local papers left before election day. If you were so inclined to write to support Tom or Michael or Maria or I, that would be greatly appreciated. Those letters of support for people who read the letters to the editor, those letters of support really make a difference. And um, I cannot tell you, some people are not um, fans of the letters to the editor, but I cannot tell you the texts, phone calls, and emails I've gotten that uh, take photos of the letter that my opponent wrote that week. And they're all fussed up and they're saying to me, did you see this? Did you see what he's saying? Can you believe this? So I, I would just say I have chosen to take the higher ground um but i and i have not gone back at him or responded i've i've um that that isn't really my style but i would just i have been saying to people if you w want to do something just write a letter about us it really does make a difference so thank you thank you for this opportunity this evening and um onward great Thank you, Anne, and thank, thank you for highlighting the letters to the editor. I mean, as you and other people have mentioned, you have a you have a vote target that you have to get, and the target is a fraction of the population, and that population reads the letters to the editor. So you need to get you know, a lot of support in those letters. Uh, and I see that Francesca is saying that she wrote one to or for you um, in this week's Star. So okay, Michael, um, please, you're you're the last one to. So I just. Yeah, I want to thank you, Catherine and Pierre, first of all, for having us tonight. Um, thank you to uh, Tom, Maria, and Anne um, for, for joining as well. I mean, you know, it's it's so important that we are coming together and talking about what we think are important for the future of uh, Southampton and, and, and the greater East End community. Um, so I think, you know, just in terms of my campaign, you know, all of the above, what everybody was saying, you know, all hands on deck at this point. Um, I'm looking forward to working with all of you as I have been. Um, and I appreciate all of the efforts thus far. And I'm so glad that you are also, uh, you know, welcoming to a lot of the other candidates that, you know, we're working together for a new vision. We want to make sure that everyday working people have a voice in government and I'm committed to that. So whatever you could do, if you could drop a donation, if you could follow me on Facebook and share my stuff, um, come to my meet and greet on October 22nd, Julie Sheehan is hosting and some of the other secret is here. And um, uh, there's a lot of folks who, who are on the call actually that are uh, taking part in that. So I'm so grateful to all of you for the support thus far and for the support that is coming down the road. So thank Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And listen, I, I can't underscore strongly enough how much we need to be what Anne, you know, called us to be at the beginning of the meeting. We need to be ambassadors for these candidates. They need our help. We need to talk to five, 10 people in our community every day, every week to make sure they go out and vote for these candidates who are going to make a change for the better for our lives in both towns and on the county level so and they need funds so i'm going to just ask everybody if you if you stayed to the end and you liked what you heard you know give them five dollars give them twenty dollars you know every little bit really makes a difference and unfortunately money is important as we head toward the end line here um, as is canvassing and phone banking so anyway um 
that's all from me for now. I don't know if anyone else from the core would like to uh, make an announcement. Any any last announcements? Can I just say one thing? If you think that five or twenty dollars doesn't make a difference, it absolutely does. Thirty seconds of radio time is thirty five dollars or fifty dollars during swap and shop. <laughs> so, all right so, yeah. <laughs> thank you I, I love that radio station and i've become addicted to 92.1 it's it's just amazing it's great <laughs> no it's thank you and for just sort of drawing it out that's that's what that's what it will do that's what a, a small amount will do so anyway again thanks everyone for your time the candidates in particular i know that every every moment counts between now and election day early voting starts october 28 um let's all be in touch and uh, um, thank you for a, a, another great peer meeting. Good luck to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.